the drone thing as just like you and me having it to fly around seems kind of like the 21st century kite. Uh, unmanned, uh, usually human controlled uh, device that flies through the air and now it's a, like a cultural phenomenon as it were. Just black boxes just flying around in the air. That's all I think about. Most people, I think, the first time they see one, it's like, oh, wow, that is really cool. As a photographer, when I see some of the pictures, I'm like, oh, man, this is great. Because you couldn't get the shot any other way. I mean, there's a lot of cool things you can do with them. The sky's the limit with it. By the time you see this, more than likely, some things have changed. Technology regulation, public opinion. This is because we are witnessing the emergence of a new game-changing technology, one that seems to have appeared out of nowhere and continues to evolve so fast that lawmakers can't keep up. I'm talking about UAVs, UASs, quadcopters, hexacopters, octocopters, but most commonly known as drones. It's the year of the drone. You know, those drone things. You can make it fly anywhere and shoot video and stuff. Your dad has a fucking drone? We are airborne. Uh-huh. Drones have actually been around for a while. Unpiloted flight has been a heavily used and highly controversial tool in the war on terror. During Barack Obama's first term as president, it is estimated that the CIA carried out nearly 300 drone strikes in Pakistan alone. The United States has taken lethal, targeted action against Al Qaeda and its associated forces, including with remotely piloted aircraft commonly referred to as drones. So we're just following somebody around, watching them, and seeing what they do. And you know, this is one of the issues that ends up leading to problems for pilots. They watch every activity. So this person goes to the market, screws around doing this, just messing around, then goes over and plays around with his Taliban buddies for two hours on two Thursday, you know, like happy hour. And then what happens is it's like, oh, we've been watching him for four weeks. I don't want to kill him. You know, I kind of got used to who he is. And so what they then do is have another crew actually kill the person. And you know, if you, and you could miss the target, which means there's bad collateral damage. But then I mean, you killed everybody except who you're supposed to. What's interesting is even though drone warfare is controversial, there's no doubt that uh, civilians were killed that shouldn't have been. A survey conducted in 2013 showed that 56% of U.S. citizens approve of their use overseas. In fact, the approval rate for military drones was higher than most other applications, including recreational and delivery. There's probably some, there's some good things that come from them, with the government using them, especially to protect our country. Because I think it's, it's all about like saving people's lives, so I mean like, if you can take a person out of the cockpit and like save his life by just putting him behind a computer screen and let, let the drone do his job for him. Sort of scope out before they invade it. There are several other applications for drones, but one that has caught a lot of people's attention is the delivery drone by Amazon. Amazon is uh, definitely heavily investing in the technology. Being a prime user and thinking, okay, now I don't have to wait two days, I have to wait two hours for my package to be delivered, I think that would be absolutely amazing, right, as a consumer. The concept is appealing to me, I, I like that. Being, being able to access something so quickly and so efficiently, just know that it's gonna get to you, I think that's really cool. Today, two-day shipping can still seem like magic. But with drones, Amazon says it plans on delivery in as fast as 30 minutes. The push to get delivery drones off the ground has taken several years and may take several more. In 2013, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos met with 60 Minutes where he explained how they work. With drones, there's somebody sitting somewhere in front of a screen. Not these. These are autonomous. So you, you give them instructions of which GPS coordinates to go to, and they take off and they fly to those GPS coordinates. What's the hardest challenge in making the, this happen? The hard part here 
is putting in all the redundancy, all the reliability, all the systems you need to say, look, this thing can't land on somebody's head. It, it will work and it will happen and it's gonna be a lot of fun. Jeff uses the word autonomous. For those of you who don't speak robot, here's what that means. Autonomous robots work independently of anything else, any other actor. They've already been programmed for a certain environment, a certain context. Semi-autonomous robots are controlled partially by themselves and partially by other folks who are controlling various aspects of their motion or of their control. And so the difference for drones, I think, is that an autonomous drone will make its own decisions while it's in flight. A semi-autonomous drone will make some decisions. For example, the drones out now can land themselves. That's a semi-autonomous drone, but you have an operator flying the drone for the most part. But even in flight, it's making its own decisions, how to control the propellers, how to account for winds and GPS coordinates. And so it's working with the human operator and the computer and the algorithms that helps fly in a semi-autonomous drone. While the drones in Amazon are considered autonomous, consumer drones, the ones that you can find at most electronic stores, are heavily dependent on their pilot. Many, however, have semi-autonomous capabilities. In 2014, DJI, the world's largest drone manufacturer, issued a firmware update that prevented their drones from being flown too close to airports. This came following several claims that drones had flown dangerously close to private and commercial aircraft. The FAA is sounding the alarm about a dramatic spike in the number of close calls between pilots and drones. Wherever you're at in the country, you're within somebody's airspace. The most dangerous places to be is around airports, where other aircraft are trying to land and trying to take off. And you have a certain diameter around that airport that you can't fly. All these uh, undermanned aircraft don't know where they should be flying and where they shouldn't be flying. It absolutely is an unnecessary uh, risk. One of the last things we're going to expect is a drone encounter. The growing number of consumer drones has caused headaches for the FAA. In 2015, they estimated that nearly 1.1 million drones would be sold during the holiday season. I would have projected it came out higher than that because every day you turn on the, your computer and Amazon's got a drone on sale that can hold your camera for $38 and it's like that makes it very affordable and people are fascinated by it. I mean, I remember being a little kid and seeing model airplanes. They crashed all the time. They were hard to fly. They're hard to fly today. A drone is easy to fly. It gives us the ability to go where the birds were. From the video production side, I think this technology is great. You know, having the ability to see things from a different perspective is a wonderful opportunity to be able to, to tell a story in a different way and, and to be able to show people things that they've never seen before. It, it's cool. I mean, it's sort of like the toy that you always wanted to have, right? And additionally, it's got a camera, so it's making some nice video. We're already starting to see lots of new kinds of shots that have been done with drones. You know, these things where they're flying through places where you couldn't do a dolly track. And, and what could I do with a drone that I couldn't do any other way and then try to, you know, try to do that thing? The benefits, I think, are, are incredible. In the TV world, you're always looking for the most captivating video. And sometimes you can get that with a lens really close to maybe like a beehive or something that's active and small. But sometimes if you get those landscape shots and you have it going over Lake Michigan with all the ice, that's gorgeous. That's going to get people to watch. And that's mainly what we use it for. When I started flying it, I'm like, hi, this is actually kind of fun. So uh, I added a, after that, I added a GoPro to it so that I could do video. Um, and then that's kind of been the main reason since then. It's just doing a lot of cool video with it. In trying to keep the millions of drones out of U.S. airspace, the FAA has enacted heavy regulation that has frustrated several drone users. The whole idea of the FAA coming in and regulating drones seemed ludicrous. I mean, they're in charge of commercial aircraft and, and airspace, and, and, and why are they going to worry about a DJI drone? Our drone pilot has to get permission from anyone that he flies the drone within 500 feet of. So if he wants to fly it in a neighborhood, theoretically, he has to get the permission of everyone living in every one of those houses and anyone driving in that neighborhood in a car. If he can't get that, then we're not legally allowed to do it. So the FAA rules um, that they've been trying to put in place, there's a lot of them. They are in conflict with one another quite often. They haven't done a very good job of communicating it out to the public. 
I would say the majority of people do not know the rules, especially all the people who buy them at Christmas at, at uh, Best Buy. One of these regulations makes it illegal for drones to be used to make a profit, unless the operator has been granted FAA approval and is a licensed pilot. Well, there's 40 hours, there's 40 hours of class time, and there's 40 hours of air time. Learning about aerodynamics, learning about physics. There's two tests you have to take, one to pass um, all your ground school, and then uh, one test to, to pass your, um, you know, your flight test. That doesn't allow me to fly a helicopter, but they don't require me to get a helicopter license. That'd be stupid, right? So why do we require commercial drone pilots to have uh, a license for a vehicle they're not flying? That doesn't make any sense. The FAA has even threatened legal action against recreational drone users who post their videos on YouTube. So you need to stop posting the videos from your drone, all right? That's the order from the Federal Aviation Administration. The agency is now sending letters to some people who post drone videos online. According to the tech site Motherboard, the FAA considers YouTube videos commercial because of those annoying little ads that pop up over the video clips, the ones you never watch. We used to be able to use amateur drone video, no problem, um, just as long as we didn't pay for it. But now there's almost rumblings of this idea where if we're giving the drone pilot publicity, that's a form of payment. So even if they give us the video, sometimes we're not allowed to use it. Some believe that the FAA's decision to place such strict regulations on drones has been a result of negative attention seen both on television and social media. Getting to know you, getting to know all about you. Get One Touch Credit Lock plus your score and report at transunion.com. Watch out for drones. A drone comes out of nowhere, crashing into the run with such force it broke into parts, missing the skier by inches. I think the public is generally reluctant to accept new technology. Dr. Nachman, did you feel threatened by the drone flying over your house yesterday? Yes, I did. Anytime some new technology comes online, people are fearful of it. People are fearful of writing things down, of the printing press, of the telephone, the telegraph, of the computer, of the internet, and ultimately of robots and drones. Oh no, it's that Amazon drone. Ah! Oh my god, Ben! We're about to die! I think after people get used to it, they understand the benefits, they understand the disadvantages. A recent video of a handgun firing drone has gone viral on YouTube. We're doomed. I mean, cell phones were loathed and hated when they first came out because people were sort of fearful of privacy issues, and now everyone has one in their pocket. Even though those same concerns still exist, we've adopted them. Recent research suggests that the majority of Americans harbor negative attitudes towards the private use of drones. Their biggest concern? The invasion of privacy. Do you have any idea how much fun we could have with this thing? We can spy on everyone! My dad said it's not for spying on people. Butters, that's all drones are for. No! The plane! The plane! It's always spying on me! Go away or I'm gonna call the policeman! They seem like such invasive pieces of technology that I would like to know who's operating the machine that's flying above my house or where I work or where I hang out. Like, I would just like to know. I feel a little, like, slightly violated. Like, that's, like, my space and, like, you know, a lot of drones have cameras on them and stuff, and most of them do. And so I, I, I would feel like a little, like, a trespass was occurring. I wouldn't like that very much. The camera is a little iffy to me. That the fact that they can just put it up over someone's, like, backyard and take pictures of them. Get the hell off the space above my lawn! The idea somehow that there's this all new perspective from which we can be observed and we never really thought about it except perhaps implicitly, now it's become quite explicit. And I think it upsets a lot of people. I don't like the idea that just the general public, this is like a big thing for them. It's kind of invasive of everybody's space. Recording someone, you know, their incident of you know, their bikini top falling off at the beach <laughs> and it being recorded and then played on social media. I think that um, that would be, um, that would be one, that would be an, exa an example. So having a camera with something that can be that hidden seems a little bit mischievous. I don't know, the whole feeling of just someone watching you. 
It's pretty creepy. <laughs> Americans view privacy very much as almost like a property right. Uh, it's kind of a this sense of ownership, and we talk about it almost as a as a moral space, right, where there's boundaries and you can't cross into my boundary and and that kind of thing. And so I, I do think um, the the traditional notion of privacy in America has, is so bound up with this idea of you cannot intrude on my space. You know, you can't come into my home, right, uninvited. That is where I think Americans are going to be most sensitive about having drones. The first thing. I obviously that comes to mind is it would be the Peeping Tom's favorite device and apparently they're being used that way. Uh, a couple of teenage girls were out sunbathing in the privacy of their fenced-in, privacy fenced backyard and a drone came flying over the fence. The father was at home, pulled out a shotgun, took it out of the sky. Now the drone operator was quite angry and uh, wanted the, the dad to pay for it and the dad of course said absolutely not, anything like that over my backyard, you do it again, I'll shoot it again. So you think about things like that, that they can be used to invade privacy. In 2014, a 17-year-old boy was flying his drone on a beach in Connecticut when he was attacked by a woman who thought he was using his drone to take pictures of girls on the beach. The woman grabbed him, ripped his shirt, punched him in the face, and stuck her fingers in his mouth. When the police arrived and checked the footage from his drone, all they found was high-up aerial footage similar to this. I think the perception is that it's like this technology that's used for spying, and that you know people think that it, because it's got a camera on it, it's going to be intrusive. They don't have a very you know, long range lens anyway. So you're gonna, to, to really make it useful in an application like that, you're gonna see the, the quadcopter. It's like 10 feet away from you hovering. So I, I think it's kind of funny that they, they see it flying half a mile out and they're like, oh no, they're looking at me. Um, you, if you ever watch the video on, that someone has on their screen when they're actually flying it, you can't make out people. They're like little specks. Research shows women more than men tend to associate drones with the invasion of privacy. But men are not the only ones flying drones. I'm Sarah Skorzak, and I'm our continuous membership chairman of Awesome Kappa. I do own a drone myself. A growing trend among sororities is to create high quality video for events like recruitment. And recently, this has included the use of drones. I want to show this whole chapter. I don't want to see two girls walking down the hallway. I want to see 20, I want to see 30, I want to see all 92 of us together as what we are, as our sisterhood. Public attitudes about drones and privacy may change as the technology becomes more common, but how should drone operators manage the current stigma that comes with using one of these machines? You know, just be a, a conscientious pilot, I think, is probably really important. That way you're not the one creating the stories on the news. I think the biggest thing drone users can do to help themselves is to fly them responsibly. Don't fly over people. Don't fly into people. Uh, don't fly over property that's not yours without permission. I think it would make very good sense to have drone users get a location permit um, or just permission slips, sort of like we use talent releases on people, get a location release on the location if it's, if it's not your property. So I think everything that, that a drone operator can do to be responsible and to demonstrate responsibility, that's going to improve their image in the public. There are rules in place um, for, for what can be done with them and what shouldn't be done with them. So I think things that, that drone users can, can do to, to kind of reverse that, that negative stigma is to operate them responsibly. Let people know what you're doing. I think just, just having a thoughtful approach, you know, just kind of thinking through what, what might happen or what people might think of it. Uh, and then trying to, trying to accommodate those kinds of things. So just, just kind of thinking ahead and communicating are the two main things that come to mind. The best thing you can do when you're flying is to talk to the people that are around you, the people that ask questions, try to disarm their, their you know, inquiries. Um, if they come at you with negative uh, questions, you know, let them know the positive uses of the technology, show them the technology. They look at the screen and they see that you're seeing this you know, huge vista on the screen and they think, wow, that's really neat, you know, that video's going to be cool. So I think it's really just about talking to the people that you know, are around when you're flying and, and just let them know. What, it's, what, what the good uses are for it and that you're not some 
nefarious person up to no good. This is just the beginning, a start to the much needed conversation of where this technology is headed. The benefits are obvious, but in our eagerness to adopt this new tool into our culture, we can't ignore the apparent implications. Are we in the drone age? Not yet. But one day in the near future, you may look up in the sky, and where you once saw birds, you'll see drones. <laughs>